Gaude amus omnes in domino. I am going in the way of the fathers, for I see myself being summoned by the Lord. Welcome to The Way of the Fathers, a podcast sponsored by CatholicCulture.org. I'm your host, Mike Aquilina. In this, our 11th episode, we meet a fascinating figure from the second century. His name is Melito of Sardis. If we were studying Melito in the years immediately after his death, we might have discussed him earlier among the, the apologists, the Greek writers of the second century who explained and defended the faith to non-Christians. Melito was best known in ancient times for his work defending Christianity. He was known in particular for the book that he addressed to the emperor Marcus Aurelius around 170. It took great courage to write such a work in those days. Marcus Aurelius was among the most well-known of the cultured despisers of Christianity. Renowned as a philosopher, Marcus was both a student and a patron of anti-Christian literary figures, and he happened to be the most powerful man in the world. During his 19-year reign, he seemed never to initiate persecution of Christians, but he did tolerate it. He did turn a blind eye to mob violence in local pogroms when they erupted, and they sure seemed to erupt often while he was on the throne. Melito lived in Sardis, a prosperous city situated in an inland valley in Asia Minor, the land we know today as Turkey. Sardis was home to a historically important church. It was founded in apostolic times and is one of the churches singled out for reproach in the New Testament book of Revelation. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, I know your works. You have the name of being alive and you are dead. Awake and strengthen what remains and is on the point of death, for I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God. Melita was born perhaps a generation after that divine warning was delivered to Sardis. Maybe he is evidence of the city's repentance. Because even in his lifetime, Melito was renowned as a saint. His reputation spread far and wide. His contemporary and fellow bishop, Polycrates of Ephesus, said that Melito lived altogether in the Holy Spirit. Melito's near contemporary, Tertullian, living in North Africa, said that many Christians counted Melito among the prophets. A century later, the church historian Eusebius paired Melito with Irenaeus, as the two exemplary early witnesses to the true humanity and true divinity of Jesus Christ. He was a prophet, living altogether in the Spirit. He was an apologist, able to elucidate the doctrine of Christ for the understanding of strangers. But he was also a bishop, and so he spoke with hierarchical authority. We're told that he ended his days as a martyr, laying down his life for his faith in Jesus Christ. However, we know nothing about his martyrdom except the simple fact, noted by a reliable witness soon after the event. It seems that Melito was a prolific author, and he wrote in what we would today consider a wide variety of genres and academic fields. Apologetics, biblical commentary, poetry, preaching, and more. In those days, a bishop was expected to do it all. Melito wrote the earliest known commentary on the biblical apocalypse, the book of Revelation, and oh, how illuminating that would be, written as it was by a man who grew up in the church of Sardis, not long after its public shaming by divine decree. We possess hardly any early Christian exposition of that most enigmatic book of scripture, how hard it is to know that the great Melito wrote about it, and his book is lost. Unfortunately, all of Melito's works were lost until one, only one, was discovered in the last century. 
it was an almost complete Greek manuscript, and some of its missing sections were later filled in by quotations in other sources and by Coptic and Latin translations discovered still later on. It's in the pages of that one work that we, almost two millennia after his death, can come to know Melito of Sardis. The work is titled Peripasca. We can translate it into English as On Easter. But if we do, we'll entirely miss the point. Because English is one of the very few languages that give the Christian Holy Day a different name from the Jewish Holy Day that was its predecessor and original occasion. In almost every other language on earth, the Jewish Passover and the Christian Easter bear the same name, and it is some variant of the original Jewish name, Pesach. For most Christians today, like most Christians in the ancient world, Passover is Passover. The holiday differs its meaning depending on whether you're a Christian or a Jew, but the name stays the same. Melito's Peripasca is about Passover. Specifically, it's about the Christian reading of the Exodus story. It is, in fact, a script for the Christian celebration of the Passover and proclamation of the Exodus. But before we can talk about that, we need a bit of background. Melito lived at a time when the faith was very close to its origins in the culture of ancient Israel. Many, if not most, of the first generation of Christians had grown up as Jews, Jews who believed and practiced their religion to varying degrees. They did not see their baptism as a rupture with the past. Rather, they saw it as a completion or fulfillment of the promises God had made to the patriarchs and prophets of Israel. They understood themselves as part of the renewed covenant, the new assembly, which included both Israel and the Gentiles. Many of these early Christians retained Jewish customs and even religious practices. It was their ethnic as well as spiritual heritage. We see this in the New Testament as Paul makes pilgrimage to Jerusalem for a feast day and cuts his hair to mark a vow he's taken. Modern historians believe that many Jews followed this path. That is one of the main theses of Rodney Stark's book, The Rise of Christianity. He argues that the so-called mission to the Jews succeeded in the first generation and, quote, Jews continued as a significant source of Christian converts until at least as late as the 4th century, unquote. Stark demonstrates, moreover, that a distinctive Jewish Christianity, or Christian synagogue, endured with a certain vitality well into the 5th century. I would take issue only with his words mission and conversion. The words can be used to describe these early communities and their adherents, but only with important qualifications. Mission implies a going outward. Conversion, in its modern sense, means changing from one thing into a different thing. But in the first and second centuries, Jews who entered the New Covenant did not see their progress in those terms. They saw clear continuity with their past. Jesus said he'd come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Paul identified himself by turns as a Jew, an Israelite, a member of the tribe of Benjamin, and a Pharisee. Not all Jews converted, of course, and there was certainly conflict between Jews who did and Jews who didn't. When Paul was in Corinth, he preached for three months in the synagogue before he was finally pressured to stop. That's a long stretch of accommodation. And when he moved on, he simply set up shop nearby and continued speaking to both Jews and Greeks. This arrangement continued for centuries, as Stark makes clear. In the ruins of Dura Europas in Syria, there are two synagogues quite close together, very similar to one another in decoration and design. One of them served as a Jewish synagogue, and the other as a Jewish Christian synagogue. 
It seems quite likely that our man of the hour, Melito of Sardis, was living in such a situation. His contemporary, Polycrates, didn't say this outright, but it's implicit in what he said. Polycrates placed Melito on a list of prominent bishops who came from a Jewish background and continued to observe the Passover in keeping with certain Jewish customs. Polycrates is defending the Christian use of these Jewish customs, and he describes Melito with a Greek term that refers to a shared ethnic background. They are brothers, he says, and he likely intends this to describe the bond of their common Jewish origin. Melito's only surviving work seems to confirm this. Peripasca is often described as a long Easter homily, but it is more likely an Easter liturgy. It shows us the Passover rite as celebrated by Jewish Christians. It fulfills the command of Jesus, who said at his last Passover meal, Do this in remembrance of me. But it also fulfills the expectation of a traditional Jewish Haggadah. The Haggadah is the scripted retelling of the mighty works of God at the time of the Exodus, when the Israelites experienced deliverance from slavery in Egypt. But it is more than a recitation. It is an interpretation of the event and a reliving of the Exodus as a present reality. At the Jewish Passover, the Haggadah proceeds by way of dialogue, usually within a family and between a father and his son. In the course of the scripted conversation, the father explained the symbolic meaning of specific elements of the meal, the lamb, the unleavened bread, and the bitter herbs. In Peripasca, we see the similarities and differences in a Christian Passover. Melito tells the story of the Exodus, but he presents it entirely as a past event that has been fulfilled in the crucifixion and death of Jesus. Moreover, he shows the Son of God as the primary actor in the original Exodus drama. In one passage, Melito says, This was the one who guided you into Egypt and guarded you and himself kept you well supplied there. This was the one who lighted your root with the column of fire and provided shade for you by means of a cloud, the one who divided the Red Sea and led you across it and scattered your enemy abroad. This is the one who provided you with manna from heaven, the one who gave you water to drink from a rock, the one who established your laws in Horeb, the one who gave you an inheritance in the land, the one who sent out his prophets prophets to you, the one who raised up your kings. In Melito's narrative, it is Christ who liberated the Israelites from Egyptian bondage, and it is Christ to whom the Jews owe their thanks at the Feast of Passover. Here's something strange about the text. In telling the Paschal story, Melito draws exclusively from the Old Testament, and mostly from the book of Exodus and he never once quotes the Gospels. He never once quotes the Epistles. He never once quotes the New Testament. The work is almost 7,000 words in English translation, and never does it move beyond simple allusions to Christian texts. And yet it is profoundly Christian. Melito assumes that the people in his congregation share a common and deep knowledge of Jewish culture, and he assumes that they share a Christian interpretation of the major events of Israel's history. He does not deny the value or dignity of the original events, but he makes clear that their true value can only be discovered in light of Jesus Christ. The ancient events are types. They foreshadow. They prefigure. But Christ is their fulfillment. In the course of his poetic text, he actually explains the principles that are at work. A pattern of something to come, a pattern of wax or clay or wood, is made for this reason, that the thing to come, loftier in height and mightier in power, beautiful in form and rich in adornment, may be seen through the small, perishable pattern. But when the thing foretold arises, The pattern is destroyed as useless, yielding to the truth of nature the image of that truth. What was once precious 
becomes useless when the naturally precious is revealed. To each thing its own time, for the type its own time, for the fulfillment its own time. His point is that the time to celebrate the type has long passed. With the resurrection of Jesus, Israel is called to celebrate the fulfillment. His language can sound rather harsh as he complains about the refusal of the Jews to accept their Messiah. We today read it and cannot help but remember painful events in recent history. The anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism of the Nazis and the Tsars and the Soviets and the Klan. It makes us wince when we hear him tag Israel with responsibility for the death of Jesus. But we have to put our modern assumptions aside. Melito was not speaking from outside the family, as the Nazis or Klansmen were. He was speaking as a family member. He situated himself within the tradition of Israel's prophets, who did not hesitate to reproach their people and issue blame and call them to repentance. Melito was clearly influenced by the fourth gospel, and he took John's language as his own. John the Evangelist clearly distinguished the Jews who believed Jesus from the Jews generally, and he used the latter term to indicate Jesus' opponents. Yet John himself was steeped in Jewish tradition and culture, and so is Melito. From our perspective, their language seems incendiary and insulting, but that is only because of much later historical figures who abused that language and exploited it. Neither John nor Melito wished any harm to come to the Jews of their time or any time, Jews whose number included their family members and neighbors. They wished only good for them, the same good that they had come to know in the gospel. Christians today cannot return to this language any more than we can go back to those times. Family disputes can be the most bitter. Ask police officers, and they'll tell you that the most dangerous calls they get are to scenes of domestic violence. Passions run high. People say things that are immoderate and intemperate. Sometimes they say things they wish they could retract. The parting of the ways between rabbinic Jews and Christian Jews was a bitter affair. People who agree on so much, who called upon the same God of Israel using the same words, now focused with intensity on their points of disagreement, and tempers flared. And those points were very important points. Christians worshipped Jesus as God. If they were right, then Jews should be giving him due homage. But if the Christians were wrong, they were, in the eyes of the Jews, guilty of idolatry. Christians also argued that the ritual laws of Moses were no longer binding. If the Christians were right, then the Jews were wasting their time. If the Christians were wrong, then they were grossly negligent and disobedient to the word of God expressed in the Torah. These were not small matters, and they were aggravated in the second century by the second Jewish revolt. Christians judged it a nationalistic war and refused to participate. The rebels, however, saw themselves as holy warriors battling for the sake of righteousness, as the Maccabees had done two centuries before. Jewish Christianity and Rabbinic Judaism were both undergoing a difficult period a forced self-definition. This involved making difficult and hard distinctions. It often involved on both sides language that seems unnecessarily insensitive by today's standards. Our hindsight is always 2020 in these matters. Melito of Sardis is often cast as a villain in that long ago drama. One critic in the last century referred to him as the first poet of deicide. But the charge is untrue and unjust. Melito himself would surely have accepted his own share in the guilt of the Messiah's lynching. He would have accepted it not simply as a Jew, 
but as a Christian and as a human being. It was the sins of all of us that caused the death of Jesus. As Melito himself put it, quote, In every soul sin left its mark, and those in whom it placed its mark were destined to die. Unquote. That means everybody. In Peri Pascha, he rejoiced that Christ welcomed sinners in spite of their universally shared responsibility for his death. Melito says, Therefore, come, all families of men, you who have been befouled with sins and receive forgiveness for your sins. I am your forgiveness. I am the Passover of your salvation. I am the lamb which was sacrificed for you. I am your ransom. I am your light. I am your Savior. I am your resurrection. I am your King. I am leading you up to the heights of heaven. I will show you the Eternal Father. I will raise you up by my right hand. In Melito's worldview, Jews and Gentiles share responsibility for their sin, but they also share together in the power of the Passover to remove their guilt. He would be mad, not to say uncharitable, if he could wish anything less than the fullness of redemption for all his family members and neighbors. Melito was not always appreciated by his fellow Christians. He was among those in the early church who celebrated Easter every year on the same day as the Jewish Passover, whether or not it fell on a Sunday. In Rome, and in the West generally, it was the custom to celebrate Easter not on the anniversary date of the resurrection, but on a proximate Sunday. Jewish Christians typically observed the feast on the 14th day of the Hebrew month Nisan. As a result, they were often called quartodecimens, which might be translated into English as 14ers. And whenever the 14ers cited their pedigree, they claimed Melito as their own. Both sides of the dispute got agitated in the second century, and excommunication seemed inevitable. But Polycarp of Smyrna paid a visit to the Pope and calmed the waters. Decades later, Irenaeus of Lyon traveled to Rome, again to argue for accommodation of diversity within the Church. Not until the Council of Nicaea in 325 was Sunday mandated for the Easter celebration throughout the Universal Church. We know Melito now for one of his writings. Thanks be to God for the discovery of that one manuscript. But we should remember him mostly, as the ancients did, for his holiness, because he lived in the Spirit at all times, because he was a prophet. We'd like to bring the message of Melito and the message of all the fathers to more and more people in our own time. So please consider making a donation to keep these podcasts going. Our sponsor, CatholicCulture.org, is run by Trinity Communications, a nonprofit organization. So donations are tax deductible in the United States. Donations can be made by credit card, PayPal, check, or in the form of stock. So please go now to our donation form at CatholicCulture.org slash donate slash audio. We pray for our benefactors every day. I thank you for listening. De quorum solemnitate Gauden tangeli Et collaudant Way of the Fathers is just one of the podcasts produced by CatholicCulture.org. To hear more from the Church Fathers in their own words, check out Catholic Culture audiobooks, readings of Catholic classics including the Fathers and St. John Henry Newman, and for interviews on a wide range of topics in Catholic arts and culture, listen to the Catholic Culture podcast.